Hi, and welcome to the Thrive Method Hub channel. I'm so glad that you're here. I'm answering a really important question today that I know a lot of us as cancer survivors or thrivers think about and that we talk about a lot if we've ever been affected by cancer in any way or if have had anyone around us affected by cancer. It's both complex and simple at the same time, but the question is, does sugar feed cancer? My name is Becky. I'm a naturopathic doctor of over 10 years, a cancer thriver of over 20 years. I was diagnosed with synovial sarcoma at 16, and I'm also a mom of three beautiful girls. So the question today actually is really complex. Yes, sugar does feed cancer cells, but it also feeds our normal cells. And that's part of the reason why we think about the impact that it also creates on our body to create this environment that allows for different disease process to, processes to occur. And the first way that sugar can impact our health is actually through impacting that insulin dysregulation or imbalance. When we eat high sugary foods, it actually allows our blood sugars to spike up. And when the blood sugars spike, then we get a release of insulin, which then is followed by a release of insulin-like growth factors. And insulin-like growth factors are important because we know that they may actually help cancer cells to grow. So mitigating that blood sugar by not eating as much sugar so that the, spike, the blood sugar spikes can't happen and that release of insulin also is modulated and that release, more importantly, of that insulin-like growth factor gets blunted, those are some strategies when we think about you know, eating high sugar foods or not. One of the ways that we can help to modify that is to help modify that insulin response. The second impact that sugary foods can have on our body is actually through oxidative stress. So sugary foods actually cause more oxidative stress to happen in our bodies, and that's kind of like rust in our bodies or rust in a car. The way that we help to modulate or offset that is actually through antioxidants. And antioxidants come in our foods in different ways, including our fruits and our vegetables, and maybe some supplements that we also take on top of that. The third way that sugars can impact our health is actually through increased production of fat. And that leads us to increased risk of things like obesity and increased um, risk for diabetes and other chronic diseases that also impact our health in so many different ways. And that environment in our body being more prone to diseases like cancer as well. The fourth way that sugar can actually impact our health is actually through that chronic inflammation that it can cause. And inflammation is a normal response actually to injury or stress or infection of some sort, but it has a start and a stop period. With chronic inflammation, you don't have that. It starts for no apparent reason necessarily and continues on without that stop mechanism happening. And what can occur with that chronic inflammation is that we can get more DNA damage that can then lead to more cancerous type processes that we then again don't want to happen. Now, how much sugar is a normal American person having? And daily, a normal American person is actually consuming about 22 teaspoons of sugar a day. And that is very much different from the recommended amount from the American Heart Association of six teaspoons for females and nine teaspoons a day for males. As you see, our society in general, we thrive on sugar and it's very addictive. So there's a reason why a lot of times when we eat more sugary foods, we tend to continue to eat that because it becomes a cycle. And it's something that our body starts craving. So sugary foods um, like donuts, cookies, any processed foods with lots of sugar in them, sort of juices or pops are also the types of sugars that we don't want to incorporate in our bodies. And so those are the things to note that sugar actually and the sugar type does also matter and plays a key part. So simple sugars, again, are sugars that we don't want to incorporate. And that's why we want to start moving into more things like complex carbohydrates. So when we're looking at complex carbohydrates, we're looking at things like whole grains, brown rice, quinoa, amaranth, and other grains that actually have more fiber in them and more nutrients and can break down into sugars a lot more slowly than these simple carbohydrates can. And that also then offsets that insulin response that we have and that release of insulin-like growth factors that we just discussed. 
The other re thing to note actually too is that sugars don't just come from carbohydrates or don't just come from these sugary drinks or sugary foods that we have. Sugars actually can also come from the breakdown of protein and fat and again those carbohydrates. So it's so critical that we have the right types of foods as well. So some tips to think about is that fat and protein actually incorporated in different meals can actually help to offset that really big spike in our blood sugars. And so one of the tips that we see um, from data is actually that if we eat our fats and our proteins first in our meal and then incorporate our carbohydrates, that it can actually help to modulate some of that sugar response. So again, that fat, protein first, alongside with your vegetables and anything else that you have, but that, that carbohydrate would be last in the meal to help again offset that blood sugar response that our body can have. The other thing that we also want to note is that when we have these um, different types of foods that have greater nutrient content as well as higher fiber content, it can also help to offset that um, oxidative stress that we see with high sugary intake as well as that chronic inflammation. So another critical reason why what we eat matters so much. If we're looking at having some healthier sugar substitutes, then we need to start considering things like honey, maple syrup, um, blackstrap molasses, stevia, um, also things like um, coconut sugars are tend to be also a little bit more lower in glycemic index and monk fruit extract if you've ever had that. What we also want to note is that if you're making any sort of um, recipe and if you're using some of these sugars that they may not be a one-to-one -to, -one to the sugar content that that recipe has. For me I find that a lot of times when I'm using maple syrup especially in honey that I often use about a third or a half of what the recipe actually calls for and it's sweet enough just as it is. Also note that just because we're increasing the sugary foods that we have, but they're actually healthier sugars, actually doesn't mean that it ends up being healthier because what happens is no matter if it's healthy or, or not a healthy sugary treat, that it actually propels us to crave more health, more sugary foods as well. And so that's one tip to also note to start lowering the amount of sugar in general or that sugary taste that we have in general to offset our desire and our craving to have these foods. I totally get it because I'm also a big sugar fiend. My parents owned a store as I was growing up and so I know what it feels like to move from eating lots of sugar to then have to completely change your diet, but our bodies really adapt and you often, once you start weaning off of that sugar, you don't really need it as much, nor do you crave it as much. So I hope all of these tips helped you. Please like, share, and save, and subscribe to this channel, and I'll see you in the next one.